Okay, I guess let's start. So um, uh, welcome everyone to the second Topos Institute Colloquium. Um, next week, we will have Gunnar Carlson talking about uh, relative topology and motion planning. Uh, but this week, we're delighted to have Richard Garner, and he'll be telling us about co-models of an algebraic theory. So take it away, Richard. Thank you, David. And thanks very much for the invitation to speak. And I'm very happy to see so many familiar and unfamiliar faces here. And I hope I've got something interesting for you. So I'm going to start with, uh, I'm going to start quite elementarily by either telling you or reminding you about equational algebraic theories. And there's something quite interesting here because equational algebraic theories are important in mathematics and they're also important in computer science and they're important in completely different ways and the way that they're used is completely different. And so I'm just gonna try and try and bring a few of those points out as I talk about this. So equational algebraic theories. Okay, so I'm just gonna give you the definitions. I'm not gonna give you all the details, but just enough to know what we're talking about. So signature is a set sigma of operations, uh, which we might call little sigma. And each of those is assigned an arity uh, absolute value of sigma, and that is in, well, I guess the classical view is that the arity is a natural number. So it could be unary, binary, ternary, and so on. But a more general view is that the arity is just a set. So this allows for infinitary operations. Okay, so in mathematics, typically we only use finitary, or often. Um, Whereas in computer science, having at least countable around is very useful. So let me give an example from mathematics. So the signature for groups, for groups, uh, sigma group, is there's a binary operation multiplication, there's a nullary operation giving the unit, and there's a uh, unary operation inverse. So, and then here I have arities two, zero and one, okay? So given a signature sigma and a set A, we can recursively define um, a set sigma A, so sigma brackets A of sigma terms with free variables in A. And again, I don't want to give you the, well, not again, but I don't want to give you the formal definition of, uh, of the sigma terms. But for example, um, if I look in the signature of groups, of things containing the variables x, y, z, then that contains things like, well, x dot y dot z inverse, or maybe y dot e inverse dot x dot x, and so on. Okay, so just all the things I can build out of my basic operations, starting from the variables. Okay. So an algebraic theory, sigma, uh, T, is a signature sigma plus a set of equations. So an equation is a triple A, S, well, an equation, let's say it like this. So each uh, equation is S equals T for some S and T in uh, sigma A. 
let's say, maybe better to say is for some A and some, for some A and ST and sigma A. Okay, is that clear? All right. Don't they need the same free variables on S and T? So um, sigma A, so something in sigma A can have uh, free variables from, from that set, but it doesn't need to involve all those free variables. So for example, in, in sigma group X, Y, Z, you can see this last term here doesn't actually involve the variable Z. So the way I define the things with free variables in A um, is that any of the elements of A is a sigma term with free variables in A. And if I've got a bunch of sigma terms with free variables in A, then I can apply one of my basic operations to it and get a new sigma term with free variables in A. So I don't require you that said, having the If you in said a. x equals y, that would be a valid equation? x equals y is a valid equation, that's right. And that forces your theory to be degenerate. Okay. Okay, good. All right. Now, as well as just these, these sigma terms, if I got a bunch of equations between certain terms, then that induces a bunch more equations between other terms, because I can substitute that quality into inside terms. Um, and I can use transitivity and reflexivity over quality and so on. And therefore, I get a sort of derived notion of equality between terms, and I can quotient out by that derived notion of equality. And I get what I might call a set of T terms. So if T is an algebraic theory, um, and A is a set, then I write T of A for the set of T terms with variables in A. So it's the quotient. So it's the quotient of sigma A by T derivable um, equality. Okay. All right. And again, I don't want to give you a precise definition of that. Uh, I mean, maybe I should have just given you the example here of what some uh, what some equations might look like, for example, in the theory for groups. So let's just do that. So e.g., so in the theory of groups involves equations such as x dot y dot z is equal to x dot y dot z, x dot x inverse is equal to e. And I guess there's three more, which you're probably all familiar with, and so I write them down, but that just gives you the idea, okay? All right, now in this example here, I can say, well, what for the theory of groups is T group of A, and that is just the free group with generating set A. Okay, so the free group is indeed the set of um, terms in the language of groups quotiented out by the generating equalities in the language of groups, um, starting from my set A, okay? All right, and so in general, I could take any other sort of notion that's algebraic in mathematics, so like a ring or a module or something like that, and I could create from that an algebraic theory and then for the corresponding, for this algebraic theory, T of A would always be the free widget on the set A, okay? All right, so that's mathematics. So in computer science, we use algebraic theories to encode notions of computation. A 
Okay, and so this idea goes back to Eugenia Moji in 1991. So Eugenia Moji took the view that notions of computation could be encoded by monads on set. Now monads on set are really the same thing as equational algebraic series, or rather every equational algebraic theory generates a monad on set. So if T is an algebraic theory, then this operation A goes to TA underlies a monad on set. And so Moji's view is that you should start with a monad on, on set or on some other category. And that base category encodes a sort of base notion of computation. So the category of sets and functions is a sort of very strange programming language, but it is some kind of programming language that allows you to do all sorts of things you can't normally do and doesn't allow you to do all sorts of other things you normally can do, but nonetheless. Um, and then on top of that base category, giving your, notion, um, giving your sort of base notion of computation, you add a monad, which allows you to encode extra features, which might be things like non-determinism or interaction with um, an external environment or access to a store or something like that. Okay, so that was Moji's view. Um, so then in the sort of early 2000s, so sort of 2001, two, three, something like that. Um, John Power and Gordon Plotkin um, took the more refined view that rather than looking at a monad on set, I should look at um, an equational algebraic theory. Okay, and so I'm just gonna explain this sort of combined perspective. And so the way this works is as follows. So I think that T of A, so T, remember is my equational algebraic theory. And I think that T of A is the set of programs um, with uh, computation in T returning values in A. Okay, so this sort of sounds like nonsense unless you see some examples. So let me show you some examples. Okay, so let V be a set. Okay, and I mean, before I go on, I should say that this perspective is not theoretical. So if any of you are familiar with Haskell, I'm sure lots of you are familiar with Haskell, but in Haskell, you have the notion of a monad and those monads are used to encode um, things like input output, um, interaction with the store or all sorts of other, or non-determinism. And those monads are the same monads. I mean, so this is actually literally implemented in this manner in, in Haskell. So typically any purely functional programming language that needs to um, have sort of side effects or interaction will use some feature like this. Okay, so anyway, here's the example. So let V be a set, the theory of Vary input, which I'm going to call T sub so in, has one Vary operation. So remember, I said that my arities of my operations could be arbitrary sets. And this Vary operation is called read, and it has no equations. So the idea is this is going to encode a notion of computation where at any point during my computation, I can stop and ask my external user to give me a value in V. And then I take that value in V and do whatever I want to with it in my program. Okay, and so the way this is encoded is as follows. So, so we see elements of the set T in A as programs returning values in A in the set A as follows. Okay, so one thing that we can do is we can look at an element A in A and that I can view just as a bare free variable inside T of A. 
and the program that corresponds to, I could just write as return A. On the other hand, the other thing I can do is take read, which is a VRE operation, and apply it to a bunch of existing terms inside T in A, okay? And so it's a V index family, and I use a lambda notation for this. So I'll write read lambda V T V. So here each uh, T V is already in T of A. And so this is a recursive definition. And the way I see this is that this corresponds to the following program. So let V be the result of reading something from an external input in T, T sub V, okay? So the idea is that this, this read thing here, first of all, it reads the value, it binds that value to the variable V, and then it continues as T V, okay? All right, so maybe that's even more clear if I give an example to my example. So when V, say, is the set of natural numbers, so I can query for my, from my, uh, from my user, a natural number at any point. So I can stop and say, give me a natural number. So I'm gonna describe in this case, a program T in of the natural numbers, in T in of the natural numbers. This is a program which is gonna return a natural number, possibly ask a request after requesting various natural numbers from the user. So we have a program in T in, which looks like this. So it says read lambda v dot read lambda w dot um, uh, v plus w. Okay. So v plus w here is an element of n, the return type. And indeed, if I spell this program out, it looks like this. So this. What is the subscript of t? Ln or in? Uh, uh, that just says in. So the theory of very input, I call T sub in. So this is just T sub in. Yeah. Okay, so what program does this correspond to? I'm just gonna translate in, uh, in the way I described above. So it just says, let, be, let V be the result of reading something in, let W be the result of reading something in return v plus w. Okay, so I read two values from the user and return um, uh, their sum, okay? And I return it to, to the program, not to the user. Okay, and maybe this would be familiar in some kind of Haskell notation. I could write this, let v, let do, and then v bind from read, W find from read, return V plus W. Okay. So that's the that's the Haskell notation. And if you're familiar with Haskell, it should all look quite familiar. Okay. So that's a simple example of an algebraic theory. Now you'll notice that algebraic theory, so an algebraic theory for computation. You'll notice that had no equations. Let me just now describe a slightly more complicated one. So let V be a set. So the theory of a V valued stack Okay, and so this I think originates in Goncharov 2001 has So it has um, unary operations, push sub v for v and v. And then it's got a v plus bottom array operation, pop. Okay, so that means that, okay, suppose V is 10. So this is basically, gonna, what I'm gonna model is a stack whose values come from the set 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And there are two ways I can interact with such a stack. I can either push a new value onto that stack, which could be one of the elements from one to 10. And so that gives me 10 unary operations whose effect is to push something on the stack and then continue. Or I can attempt to pop something off the stack. Now, if my stack is non empty, then I'll return a value in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. If my stack is empty, then my attempt to pop something will fail. And so I'm going to return some kind of token bottom, which indicates that failure. And then my program can process that and continue appropriately. Okay. And so if I write that out, um, so the interpretation, so interpreted as, interpreted as, so push V of X. So in a program, I interpret that as doing push V and then continuing as X. On the other hand, if I do pop, well, I have to give it a, a V plus I have to give it a family of Im, uh, arguments indexed by V and then one additional argument. So I'm going to split those up into those two components. So first of all, I have something that gives me the first V argument, and then my final argument I'll call Y here. And this corresponds to a program which I'm going to write in my mutant, not real programming language as. So I'm going to try to let v um, b uh, pop in xv. All right, and that might fail, in which case I catch the failure and continue as y. Okay? Okay, so that's, that's the language. But the point is there are some um, equations, okay? So the equations are, there are three equations. And these express the kind of semantics you expect of this. So push V, um, pop um, vector X, Y is equal to X, V. So this says if I push a V onto my stack and then pop it off, and continue as either xv if that succeeds with value v or y if that fails. Well, in that case, I might as well not have pushed v on the stack in the first place and immediately just continued as xv. Okay. So the other one, the second equation says pop lambda v push v x x is equal to x. So that says, if I pop a value off my stack, I try and pop a value off my stack. If it succeeds and the value I get is V, I immediately push V back onto the stack. If my initial attempt to pop something off the stack fails, sorry, I try and pop something off the stack. If I succeed and get V, then I push V back on the stack and continue as X. If my initial attempt to pop something fails, then I immediately continue as X. Well, in that case, whatever happens, I might as well have not done anything and simply continued as X. So I get that equation. And in a similar manner, you can understand the following equation. Um, and I'll leave that to you to, to understand. And that says that pop X, pop Y, Z, I guess uh, that should be a vector X and a vector Y, is the same as pop vector X, Z. Okay. All right. So that's the question. Yep. With the first equation, should the output just be uh, lambda v x v? No. So that so is... in the first equation here, um, so there's one such equation for each v and v. So if you each... push v on the stack and then you pop it off afterwards, then then I'm going to get I... x. Yeah. That's right, but that's, so that's for a given V in advance. So in advance, I give you a V and I push that V onto the stack. And then I'm asking what happens when I try and pop something off the stack and continue as X, whatever. 
Well, in that case, I'm just going to get the V that I put on off again and continue as XV. Oh, I get it. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Good. Thanks for the question. All right. So I'm now going to talk about co-models of algebraic theories. So there's a standard notion of model of an algebraic theory T. So for example, a T group model is a group. I mean, that's the whole point. If this wasn't true, then the whole idea of an algebraic theory would be kind of useless and pointless. Now, a group is a set with some structure, but more generally, I could look at things like, I don't know, topological groups or um, uh, Lie groups. And those are groups in some other world, by which I mean in some other category. So more generally, we can look at T models in any category C with products, okay? So remember to start with, I said, the arities of your operations might be natural numbers or they might be arbitrary sets. So if your arities are natural numbers, then products. But I'm taking the more general view that my arities could be arbitrary sets, in which case I wanna look at a category with, with all products for this to work in general, okay? And so, for example, uh, a T group model in the category of topological spaces is, is a topological group and so on. Now, in computer science, you do you, what turns out to be useful is something which, on the face of it, looked weird. I'm going to look at T models in the opposite of the category of sets. We call these co-models. Okay, so you can imagine a co-model in some other category, but I'm just going to look at co-models in in set, which are just models in the opposite of the category of sets. So, what is a co-model? So, I'm just going to give you the what what you get if you unfold the general definition in this case. So, a co-model of an algebraic theory T involves a set S involves a co-interpretation, which I write the square bracket sigma or interpretation bracket sigma. And that's a function from S to the uh, arity of sigma times S. So this is backwards. So normally, uh, if I look at a model of my theory T in some category, I have an interpretation of each sigma, and that's going to be as an operation from X to the arity of sigma into X, okay? So in this case, I flip that around. So the map goes out of S into something, and that something is not the product of uh, mod sigma copies of S, it's the co-product of mod sigma copies of S, which in the category of sets is just given by taking this Cartesian product here, okay? All right, and so this is for all S, for all sigma in big sigma. So these induce derived co-interpretations, uh, angle brackets, so interpretation brackets T going from S to A times S for all T in sigma A. Okay, so this is this is just a, a sort of standard recursive thing. And so what I now require is that these derived co-interpretations should satisfy interpretation of S is equal to interpretation of T 
for all equations s equals t of my theory t. Okay, so there's the definition. Now let's work it out in some examples. So first of all, what happens in the sort of classical universal algebra kind of examples? Well, what happens is that everything is incredibly dull. So if I look at the theory of groups, a co-model involves a co-interpretation of this uh, nullary operation uh, E, and this is gonna be a map from S into the product of S with the empty set, which is the empty set. And the only way that can happen is if my underlying set of my co-model is also empty. So the only T group co-model is the empty set. So you can see that from the perspective of sort of classical universal algebra, considering co-model is an absolutely insane thing to do because there's just nothing there, right? So for all the, all the classical theories of universal algebra, you're more or less always gonna get something totally trivial. However, if I look at the computer science examples, something much more interesting happens. So let's look at our co-model of my theory of input. So this is a set S, um, and I'm gonna think of this as a set of states together with a co-interpretation of my read function. So remember that read is an operation of error T V. And so that's a function from S to V times S. Um, and there aren't any equations with no further conditions. Conditions. And so what we're going to think of is that this co-model is a kind of state machine. I mean, I've already sort of hinted at that by calling the set S a set of states. So the idea is that this operation read, so you think that read, so the co-interpretation read takes a state S and yields a new input value from uh, V and a next state S prime. Okay, so if you imagine that S is uh, encoding the state of the entire external universe, which happens to be deterministic, then knowing that uh, I can compute from that state um, what my putative user might provide as my next input value in V, and then how the state of the world would evolve upon the user uh, inputting that value, okay? All right, and so uh, that's nice. So what about a T stack co-model? So a T stack co-model involves uh, a set S of states and two functions. So I've got push sub V, which goes from S to S for all little v and big v. And then I've got something pop, which goes from S to the set v times bottom times S, okay? So you think that S is sort of um, encoding the state of some stack and push sub v tells you, okay, if I push a new value little v onto my stack, how, do that, uh, how does that update the state of my stack? the state encoding my stack. And similarly for pop, I take my current state and I extract from that either the value on the top of the stack or bottom indicating the stack's empty and then the state that I get after having performed that pop operation. 
Okay, and so then the equations that this have to satisfy, I can write down reasonably quickly. So maybe I'll omit the, the angle brackets here, just one well, no, I'll leave them there, why not? So if I pop, the result of uh, doing push V on a state S, then I get back S. And then the other two conditions say that if I pop S and end up with V S primed, then doing push sub V on S prime gets me back to my starting state S. On the other hand, if I pop S and I get a failure state moving, so I get a failure in my first argument and move to a new state S primed, then actually S primed must just be S. So if, I'm, if I fail to pop something, that doesn't change the state, okay? Now these three axioms just come from uh, this notion of co-interpretation that I, uh, uh, the notion of co-model. So this is just exactly what you get by kind of working through everything. I'm not gonna do that, but you can do that. And then these are the axioms that you get. Can I just check a couple of things, Richard? Yep. Um, in your definition of pop, I think yeah. the, first, the first product should be a disjoint union. Oh yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. And then in the first axiom, do you get the pair? Vs back. Mm, oh. Yeah, yeah. I've just been copying badly from my uh, the notes I made myself. But thanks for the corrections. That's okay. uh, that's much better. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. That's perfect. Okay. Good. All right. So now that that's correct, maybe easy to pass. But uh, there we have it. Okay. Good. So and in general. So. Sorry, what's the interpretation of pop here? So pop takes my current state. In that state, I've either got an empty stack or a stack with a value on it. And so what I do is either return the value on the top of the stack is my first argument in the codomain, or return bottom if there is nothing on the stack. And then I also return the, the new state obtained by updating my, my stack by either popping the top element, if there was one, or if there wasn't one, then I don't actually do anything. I just leave the state the same. I see, yeah. thanks. So, and then the general fact, so this is due to Power and Skaravka in 2004. Then there's also subsequent work of, okay, there's lots of people actually. So I'm just gonna put some dots here. So there's lots of subsequent work on this, but this is where it started. Um, the idea is that if T terms um, are programs uh, interacting with an environment, um, then T co-models are um, instances of that environment. So moreover, the co-interpretation of a program T in TA in a co-model S is a function. So remember, I said each term of your theory, which in this case is a, a program, gives me a co-interpretation function from S into A times S. And we think of this as a program which runs the computation T using uh, the state machine S starting from some state 
S in S and returning a value in A and a final state, uh, S primed in S. Okay. So I'm just gonna give you one example to sort of illustrate how that works. And so again, this, this co-interpretation um, of T just comes from the co-interpretation of the basic operations by some recursive procedure. Richard, do you mean to say state set S rather than state machine S uh, in the penultimate line? Uh. Uh, so, so maybe maybe I should say it like this. So, thanks for the the question. So my co-model is a set S with these co-interpretation things, and then I think of the whole co-model comprised of S and this co-interpretation thing as being a state machine. Perfect. All right, so I'm just gonna give you one example. So if we have the program, which we saw before, read lambda v, read lambda w, v plus w, and this is in the theory, this is a program in the theory of input over the alphabet um, of the natural numbers, and it's a program returning a natural number. Then for the co-model with um, S is just the set of three states A, B, C, and the co-interpretation of the read function being as follows, that A maps to A comma 12, B maps to uh, C comma seven, and C maps to B, comma four. So suppose that's my co-model. So it's got three states. In state A, if I ask for a natural number, then uh, that natural number, I've got all these wrong around. That natural number is 12. And after returning 12, I continue in state A. Um, in state B, if I ask for a natural number, I get seven and move to state C. In state C, if I ask for a natural number, I get four and move to state B. So in that case, I can ask for the co-interpretation of this program, let's call it P. So the co-interpretation of P is a function going from S into natural numbers times S. And so what does it do? Well, from state A, I ask for two natural numbers. So I ask my first natural number, I get 12 and move to state A. I ask my second natural number from state A, I get 12 again and I remain in state A. So at the end of this, I've got the two natural numbers 12 and 12 and I'm in state A and I return their sum. So I get 24 comma A. Similarly, if I start in state B, I request two natural numbers. First one is seven and I move to state C. The second one from state C is four and I move back to state B. So I've got seven and four and I'm in state B. So I end up with 11 comma B. Finally, if I do this starting from state C, then the two natural numbers I get are four and seven in that order and I end up in state C. So again, I get 11, but I'm ending in state C. Okay, great. Okay, so so far I've told you some history so I've just about got time to tell you some new stuff. And so this is the kind of fun fact of this talk. I think it's amazing actually, it's an amazing fact. So co-models of any algebraic theory T um, form a category. Well, let's say co-model of algebraic theory T with their homomorphisms. I won't tell you what a homomorphism is, but you can probably guess. Form a category, co-mod T.
And so here's the theorem. So you look at the definition of co-model, it looks sort of non-trivial and maybe a bit complicated. But the amazing thing is that actually it's not so bad after all. And so here's, here's my theorem. For any algebraic theory T, co-mod T is a pre-sheaf category. So I'm going to call it B sub T set. Okay? So no matter how complicated it looks like this category of co-models might be, actually it's not so bad because it's a pre-sheaf category and we know how to work with pre-sheaf categories. And we call B T, not part of the theorem really, we call B T the behavior category. Okay, so there's two ways you can prove this. One, which is the first way I did this, is just to use some general category theory. And so this is how I actually found this out. I'm not going to write this down, but I'm just going to say it because I want to show you the more explicit thing. But the general category theoretic way that this works is as follows. Comod T has a forgetful functor down to set. Now, for general reasons, this forgetful functor will always have a right adjoint and be comonadic. So Comod T is actually equivalent to the category of co-algebras uh, co for a co-monad on set. Okay. Now, the crucial point here is if I look at the forgetful functor from Comod T into set, this, just by looking at what a co-model is and thinking about it for a bit, you can determine that this forgetful functor preserves connected limits. Now, the right adjoint of this functor preserves all limits. And so in conclusion, we see that comod T is actually a category of co-algebras for a connected limit preserving co-monad on set. So connected limit preserving co-monad is the same as a um, polynomial co-monad or a directed container. And we know that the category of co-algebras of such is always a pre-sheaf category. Okay, so that's the category theoretic way of just seeing why this is true. And that's how I came up with this, this theorem. But after the fact, it turns out that you can prove it without going through that um, approach because you can just calculate this thing very explicitly. And we can calculate it very explicitly. So I'm just going to give you the definition and then say what it amounts to in the various examples we have, and then I'll stop. So the behavior category, BT, of an algebraic theory, T, has the objects are what I call admissible behaviors. So families of functions, beta sub a going from t of a to a indexed by all sets a. So the idea is that what this is, is it's a, it's a function which takes a computation and runs it in some manner to return a value, okay? But we want it to return a value in a sort of sensible way that kind of respects composition. And so there are two conditions. So if we take beta and run it just on a bare, so A here is just return A, remember. And so if I run beta on return A, I should just get A. So this is for A in A containing TA. Now, the second condition is slightly more interesting, and that says that if I take B to, and I run it on a term T applied to a bunch of terms UA, 
that should be the same as taking beta, running it on T, where T is applied to the constant family of terms, U beta T. Okay, now if you prefer, I could write this in a more Haskelly looking notation. So in Haskell, I would write this as B of T monadically sequenced into U is the same thing as beta of T. And then this is the sequencing operator that doesn't, that discards the return value. So this is run t, discard the return value, and then continue as u beta t. Okay? And so that's, that's a reasonable condition. If I want to run a, run a composite program, uh, t followed by evaluating the return value of t in u, that should be the same as first running t, ignoring the return value, and then continuing as u of beta t. Okay? So that's the admissible behavior. That's an object of this category. So that map. Um, I can also note that these objects, that these admissible behaviors are also the elements of the final co-model of my algebraic theory T. So if you prefer to think of it like that, this is just a way of describing the elements of the final co-model, okay? All right, now map from one behavior beta to another behavior beta prime um, R. Well, it's the set of M in T1, so unary operations of my theory, which I can think of as commands because they do some interaction with the external world and then don't return any useful value. Okay, so it's just a command for my state machine. And it's a command, which if I start it when I'm running in behavior beta, will end me up running in behavior beta prime, which is a, amounts to saying that beta prime is the same as doing beta of M of blank. But then there's some equivalence relation, tilde B, where tilde B is the smallest equivalence relation such that, and maybe I'll use the, the Haskell notation again here. If I do T sequenced into a bunch of unary operations M, that should twiddle T, discard return value and sequence that into M B to T. Um, let me try and give myself enough room to finish that off. Okay, now I'm not expecting you to kind of understand why this is the right answer. I'm just showing you this to, um, so that you can see that it's tractable um, and sort of obviously something you could sit down and try and work out for any given algebraic theory. And indeed, if you do sit down, then you can work it out for any reasonable algebraic theory. And so to finish, I'm just gonna show you for these two examples we've been running as we go along, what you get. So for the theory, T in for the theory of input, the behavior category looks like the following. So objects are infinite words W in V to the N. So remember, the theory of input allows you to request from the user values from the set V arbitrarily many times. And so an object here describes for my state machine, the the the, all the future responses it's gonna give if you keep asking it starting from that state um, for a new value in V. Okay, so that infinite word gives you all the the stream of values you'll get from your state machine in starting from that given state. 
okay so a map from w to w prime is a natural number n in n such that partial n w is equal to w prime the partial n w is just the result of removing the first n uh, elements from my infinite word w to so take the tail n times so basically a map takes a uh, infinite word and just deletes some initial segment of it and then that the codomain is the result of that deletion okay and that's because that's exactly what you can do when you're running your machine i can request another input from the user now i can branch in some way on that input but from the perspective of my state machine all it cares about is it's been asked for a new value and it's moved to the next state okay and so the map just encodes how the state machine sees that request for, in, for a, a new value and how it updates its um, internal state based on that. And so finally, I can show you how this worked for the theory of a, a stack. So this is kind of interesting because it is not trivial, but it has some, comp I mean, this always has some computational meaning, but it's interesting because in this case you get something that's non-trivial. And so I guess there's some non-trivial computational meaning. So the theory of stacks. So the thing is with our theory of stacks, we said, well, this just encodes a stack of values of V that I can push and pop stuff from. So we may have initially thought that that stack would probably be finite, but actually there's nothing in our axioms that forces our stack to be finite. So another possibility is that we have an infinite stack. So we may have a stack with finitely many values of V on it, or we may have a stack with countably many values of V on it. And so the objects in my behavior category are these possible arrangements of the stack, which are finite or infinite words, W in V, so I'll write V less than or equal to omega. Okay, so those are the possible states of the stack. And so the maps indicate how I can change the state of a stack by um, using my push and pop commands. So if my stack's finite, then I can turn it into any other finite stack in a unique way by popping all the elements off and then pushing a bunch, uh, another finite list of elements back on. So there's a unique map from W to W primed if both are finite. There's no maps, W to W primed, if only one is finite. I've got a finite stack, then by doing finitely many pushes and pops, I can't turn it into an infinite stack and vice versa. So the final case is where, uh, so maps W to W primed, where W and W primed are infinite, So what can I do? If I've got an infinite stack, then I can pop finitely many things off the front and then pop finite, push finitely many other things back on, okay? So basically there'll be a map from W to W. If I can get W prime from, sorry, there's a map from W to W prime. If I can get the latter from the former by deleting some initial segment and then pushing some other initial segment back on, okay? And it turns out that this is the sort of neatest way of saying that is that a map is given by an integer i such that for some n in n, partial n w is equal to partial n plus i w prime. So it says that w is a shift by the integer i of w prime, at least if you look far enough along. Okay, so if you think about it, this encodes precisely the fact that I take W, I pop off some initial segment, and then I push on some initial segment to get W primed. Okay, now that there are various ways you could do that. I could pop a, a lot more off of W than I needed to, and then immediately push it back on. But my axioms tell me that I might as well have just pop, push, popped off the minimal amount of W that I needed to before pushing back on a bit of W primed, and then, 
that's completely encoded by this integer i, which tells me the sort of eventual shift that I get to. Um, and this is quite interesting because this, this, uh, this notion of map turns up in the theory of um, C star algebras. So in the theory of um, the Kunt C star algebra, this is a certain groupoid which has these morphisms. So there's a connection here with kind of uh, that theory, which I'm not going to go into today, but um, I think that's quite exciting. And that's something that I'm hoping to uh, talk to some C star algebra people about in the near future. OK, and I think that's a perfect place for me to stop. So thank you all for listening. And back over to you, David. Thanks, Richard. This is great. Um... I guess we can, I don't think there has been any uh, questions um, that I know of in the, in what, the YouTube, but maybe we can open it up for a question just audibly if someone wants to just unmute themselves and talk. Um, can I ask a question? Please. Um, I was wondering if there was some computational content to taking subtopsis of um, these, uh, category, these categories of co-models. So is there something, say so I, I take a behavior category. So there's computational yeah. content to what, sorry, of the? To taking subtopsis of. Uh, oh, okay, uh, yeah. right. Yeah. Yes. So say I equip one of these behavior categories with a non-trivial coverage and mm -hmm. look at what corresponds to one of these three sheaths in being in a sheaf. Is there some sort of computational counterpart to these in these examples you consider? Right, right. Um, <clears throat> it's a good question. So... I'm not completely sure. It's a great question and a great idea. So I think it might be related to um, uh, so there's some work by Bunger and Funk on uh, complete spreads for toposes. And somehow th that's related to this, this work because there they're looking at distributions on toposes, which are co-continuous functors from your topos to the category of sets. So it's like a point of your topos, except you don't require preservation of finite limits. Now, uh, that is somehow in the same spirit as looking at a, a co-model. And I think in that context, you basically do end up taking these things which are basically behavior categories and then equipping them with some topology. So I think, I think that's likely, that sort of area over there is something to do with this, but I don't, I haven't actually gone into that in any detail yet, but that's just sort of wild speculation. But yeah, it's a good question. Thank you. Thank you. I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. Regarding the main theorem, do you have some intuition as to whether this is something very specific to Levere theories, like finite product theories, or do you think it could be, there's a more general situation with other notions of theory going on here? So for example, I can, so I can do something slightly more general. I can look at co-models of one algebraic theory T in the Claisley category of another algebraic theory R. Okay. So, um, so Tama has, has looked at these things. So he calls them residual runners. Now, if T and R are, uh, so if T is any algebraic theory and R is one that corresponds to a polynomial monad, then I think, again, you're still going to get a pre-sheaf category for these co-models. 
But if I drop that condition on R, then the thing you get is going to be quite complicated and very interesting, but probably not a pre sheaf category. So, I mean, in introducing this extra monad R is super interesting because it lets you encode things like kind of um, non deterministic automata and, uh, and uh, Markov decision processes and things like this. So, um, but in all of those cases, I think it's a really interesting question to say, is there some sort of combinatorial object that represents this, this category of slightly more complicated co-models? Um, equally, an interesting question would be, what happens if I enrich this picture? So, um, so John Power has advocated very strongly for using enriched Levere theories in, in computation, in particular, if you want to have recursion, then you want to look at theories enriched over some category of omega complete partial orders. And so in that setting, um, again, you can ask the question, what, what do these co-models look like? And is there some uh, kind of simple way of classifying them in, in this same way that you have this pre sheaf category here? And I don't know the answer to that, and I'd like to know. Um, and again, I'm, I mean, it'd be fantastic if there was a positive answer, because then basically you're getting some kind of combinatorial object that not only represents kind of um, this kind of programming, which is, I mean, it's somewhat non-computational in some ways, in that I can start from arbitrary functions between sets, but also I don't have recursion available. And in particular, I mean, that's a real problem here because when I add my monad, I can't do recursion with the commands coming from my monad. Whereas if I do this enriched over omega CPOs, then the commands I add in in my monad, I can do recursion over. So like, if I want to ask the user for a bunch of input values until the user says zero to stop, then um, I can't do that in this setting, but I would be able to do it in the Omega CPO setting. And so it would be nice to have a characterization of these behavior categories in something similar to that in that world. But yeah, that's still to be explored, but I think it would be on a case by case basis. I don't think there's any general reason why this would be true in these more general settings. Thanks, that's very illuminating. Could I ask a question? So um, uh, first, I want to say I think this is, this is a beautiful talk and uh, in theory. And I get the image of a giant whose uh, head is in the clouds, but his feet are firmly on the ground. So um, it's really cool to see, you know, to get that abstract nonsense one sentence explanation, but also that it unfolds into something that's very uh, concrete. It's cool. Um, so I was wondering, does every um, polynomial co-monad arise from an algebraic theory? Um, and are they equivalent? Yes. Uh, well, the, first, the answer to the first question is yes. Uh, the answer to the second question okay. is no. Okay. So, <clears throat> so, um, so um, Daniel Armin and um, and Tyler used to do have a paper on the dependently typed update monad. I think that's what it's called, or at least it's called something like that. Um, maybe Tom, I can remind us. But so there's in in this paper they talk about a monad called the dependently type update monad, and that is associated to a small category C. So very small category C, there's a dependently typed update monad associated to C. And if you take the behavior category of that uh, dependently typed update monad, uh, then that is just C that every category arises as a behavior category, okay? And every polynomial co-monad is just one giving you pre-sheaves. So yes, that's the answer to that question. So the question is whether they're the same as algebraic theories. The answer to that is, is no. So what happens is you get an adjunction between monads on set and co-monads on set. So one direction takes a monad on set to the co-monad generated by its category of co-models. So that's what we've been talking about today. So that turns out to have an adjoint. Um, and you can describe that adjoint in a sort of nice way. So I take a co-monad 
and I hom it into the identity functor in the day convolution product, and that gives me a monad. Okay. So this construction is in a paper by um, Katsimata, Rivas, and Usterlu. Um, and so they describe this construction going from a co-monad to a monad, which they call the dual monad of a co-monad. And then the one going the other way from a monad to a co-monad, they call the Swedler dual co-monad of a monad. And so this is an adjunction. Now you can characterize, you can analyze this adjunction and it turns out that what happens is that it's idempotent. So uh, if I apply it three times, it's the same as, so if I apply the, the various functors three times, it's the same as applying them once. So I start with a monad, I produce from it a co-monad, which is always a polynomial co-monad. If I go back from there, so polynomial co-monad associated to C back to a monad, I just get the dependently typed update monad associated to C. Okay, so for every monad, there's an associated dependently typed update monad, and that gives me a reflection of arbitrary monads into dependently typed update monads. Okay, um, and on the other side, if I start with any co monad, I can go around the loop and I end up back with a polynomial co monad. Okay, and so what happens is that because this adjunction is idempotent, I get an equivalence between polynomial co monads and um, dependently typed update monads. So that's the real equivalent. And the category of each of those is equivalent to the category of small categories and co-functors. So that's, that's the story there. So this, this theorem I quoted is in a, a paper. And I guess, apart from this result, that I showed you today, the thing I just described to you is in, in that paper. So it's, uh, uh, I don't know, if you look on the archive, it's got something about co-models and co-structure and co-semantics in the title, and it's probably uh, unique to identifies it. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Richard, one, one person was asking whether you'll be able to make these slides available. Maybe you yeah, yeah. send them to me or Tim. Yeah, I'll just send them to Tim and then you can put them up wherever you feel like. Great. Well, if there are no other questions. Um, thanks, Richard, again. This was great. And we'll see everyone next week. No thanks again for, um, for having me. Our pleasure. Okay. See you all next week.